I had my last son at 40, so I'm raising his little brother in recovery and learning how to be a mom. And so I learned that I need to protect this little boy from chaos and the everything that comes with that addiction. So I told my older son, you are not welcome in my home. I'm here to help. Anytime you want to go to treatment, you know I know the way. Um, and I did. I protected that little boy. Um, but my first encounter with CPS was I was three years old and I remember I remember it was nighttime. Uh, police came to my home and removed us, me and my sisters. I was the baby and three, four, and five years old. And I was put in the snow. My, my sister grabbed my arms and put me out of a window to keep me and my sisters safe. Uh, my father had come in the house and harmed a man that was in our home. And CPS took us and we never went back. My father in prison, my mother suffered from schizophrenia and unable to parent us. At 11 years old is when I started to smoke weed and drink. And after I really liked it, I caused a lot of trouble as a kid. Well, I ran away at 14. I told my, my aunt said I couldn't go somewhere and I said, I'm going. My sisters, left California on the Greyhound, got to Yakima 24 hours later, found me in 10 minutes, told my friends, I will kick your ass, tell me where my sister is. They did, and uh, they grabbed me by the arm, took me out of the house I was in, because I was with a girlfriend of mine, and so I had to go to court because I was a runaway. And the judge says, it looks, it looks like you have a family in Southern California that would like you to, to be there. Or you can go to a juvenile hall. Well, I chose Disneyland, you know? So I moved to California. And I did pretty good. Um, I met my ex-husband when I was four, uh, 14. And uh, we ended up together getting married at 19, um, having our son just before I turned 21. Uh, he's gonna be 41 next week. Um, that wasn't, I never stopped drinking during this 11 all the way up. I never stopped smoking pot while 11 all the way up and anything else somebody would try. I got introduced to crack cocaine when my oldest son was right around newborn. And I remember using crack cocaine and my ex-husband as well. And he could not stop. And so I, I looked at my son. He was about three months old in the crib. And I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I was able to walk away from it. But I still had my alcohol in my weed. Never clean. You know, to me, I was clean when I was drinking. Um, so, oh, I was 26 years old, the first time I ever tried meth, and I liked it. It um, allowed me to do more and stay awake longer, and it just, at first, I want to say for many, many, many years, not too bad. I was paying bills and doing this, doing that, working, and I left Southern California when my son turned seven because my meth had gotten a little out of control. By that time, I, my son was seven and I had another boy. His name is Joseph. But when I was gonna leave California, I was gonna get clean and sober, start a new life. And then I got to my sister's house in Spokane Valley and I found this guy that sells weed. Took me two days to find neighbors that, that could get me some weed. So I moseyed on over there, introduced myself, I'm looking for weed, and he said, no problem. And my sister said, I cannot believe you did that. My ex soon followed. He says, I love you, I miss you, I miss the boys. Um, 
weaseled his way here, and I, I thought, it's all going to be better. Well, no. Uh, we started meth in Washington. So that got worse. He was very, very violent. I remember one time getting choked to where a dome of darkness came over my, and black, black was coming over me. And I literally passed out from being choked. So I know what it's like to be choked. Um, I remember sitting down after that night. I remember thinking, if I leave him, I'm not going to have drugs. My last, my third son was born when I was 40 years old. I delivered him at 39. He was born July 5th. I turned 40 July 29th. So I was 39 when I delivered him. So I've got this baby, one, one years old, at home, 11-year-old boy, no foods in the cupboard at all, maybe a box of cereal and milk. Uh, I just remember all our money going to dope and not to our children. Those, those things I still have trouble uh, knowing that was me. Um, so CPS, there was a detective that came by one day, knocked on my door, and he said, you know, you look like a pretty good mom. You look like, detective said, I know you're selling drugs out of this house, and what I'm hearing is you're making drugs. And I told him, well, that's not true, of course. We cleaned everything up. He scared the hell out of me. And then about a week went by, and we did another line, which led to another um, cooking, another batch is what they call it. Um, second, second time, he knocked on the door, and he says, can I come in? And I said, do you have a warrant? And he said, nope. And I said, nope. And he sat on the porch with me, and he said, if I come back here again, I am going to be taking you to jail. We're all out of the house. We're all standing out in the yard. I've got my little baby. He's one year and 17 days old. His name is Jacob. And <sighs> they were waiting for one detective to come. That detective drove up. He had a pH stick, which is a phosphorus. You can, phosphorus is an ingredient and it sticks to the walls. So you can test it, and you know meth is being cooked there. He went in the house. Well, all these officers are standing in my yard, me, my ex, my baby, my son Joey, happened to be with neighbors and having fun that day. And he nodded just like that as he walked out that back door, and the handcuffs went on us. And that's when my sisters found out that I'm a manufacturer. I manufacture methamphetamine. I was incarcerated for 72 hours. When you get arrested for a crime, you're then released, unless it's a violent crime. They release you, and they tell you, give you a court date. So I got released. First thing I did was call CPS. It was during the day. And they said, my sister has my kids. I called my sister. She said, you need to get the help, and I'm not doing a damn thing for you. I'm going to take care of these kids. You got yourself into this mess, figure it out. And I really needed to hear that. I was my worst enemy. Nobody could hurt me like me. Were you showing up to be harmed? Like, I showed up for it. Um, I somehow crossed that little invisible line where it wasn't Friday night and I'm not just getting high or at a party, partying. Partying to me took me to the depths of despair. It took me about 90 days after I lost my children, July 17, 2001. It took me 90 days to go to treatment because I just kept getting high. I just kept doing what I was doing over and over again wanting so bad to stop. But by 2 p.m., I was drug-seeking. If I was awake, I was drug-seeking. 
um, everybody I hung out with did it. So, um, like I said, two weeks later, my son or my ex married my best friend in Idaho at the hitching post. So, <sighs> I had to go pee and CPS asked five things of me because I told them, what do you want from me? And I already knew I screwed up. I didn't even open the packet. They gave me a yellow envelope, legal size envelope, full of a packet. And I'm like, okay, I just put it down because I know what's in there. And my drug counselor, where I had to go pee in a cup every week, because that was one of the five things I had to do, pee in a cup whenever I call this phone number. I was brown, my color was brown, and if it's brown that day, you go pee in a cup. You walk there, you get on the bus, you get there. They told me don't ever miss that appointment. My drug counselor was amazing. He was like seven feet tall and big hands, deep voice, uh, bald head. He let me know that he was in recovery. And he said, listen, Marsha, stop the bullshit. It's what he used. Um, it's, it's like this. You, change, you do some things different, you'll get your kids back. If you don't, you won't. Oh, that appointment. So I just pondered that for a minute. I woke up the next morning. It was 9-11, and the towers were being blown up with the airplanes hitting them. I woke up to that in the afternoon, and something hit me. I was like, I need my kids now. So I went back to my drug treatment where I did my UAs, and I said, Ron, I want to go to treatment. And he gave me a high five. And he made a phone call right there while I was sitting there. And he said, your Greyhound ticket's already purchased. It'll be in three days. And then you pick up the ticket from the Greyhound. I did that. Uh, CPS provides you with a monthly bus pass, so you can do all your Things, there's no excuse not to make your appointments. After making my 16 bad UAs, I never failed a UA. I never failed to show up for a UA. And the drug counselor told me, so you show up. Honey, you have dirty UAs. What are you doing? And he just talked to me like, like I mattered. He looked me in the eye as he was speaking. Uh, I could tell he was talking from the heart. And he said, uh, I have an idea. Why don't you go to treatment? And I kept saying, all right, maybe, you know. But after September 11th, the next day, I went. And I told him, I'm going to go. She somehow or just thought I was a nice girl. She said, would you like to go for pie and coffee? And I, I said, I'm in treatment uh, up the road. I don't think I can. She went the next day and asked them, she checked me out of the treatment center so we could have a cup of coffee and pie. Just this beautiful woman in recovery. And that's how my journey started with NA. I, uh, there's always somebody to hold their hand out, to hold on to you. I get to do that today for other people. I see a woman in NA She's way in the back. She's shaking and she's scared. I go, I go sit by her and I make sure she feels welcome. That was the first time in your life you found your people. Yeah. And I um I was so grateful. I got back to Spokane and my I went First thing I did, they told me go to an NA meeting as soon as you get there. So I had to live in a transitional house. So before you leave treatment, thank goodness there was somebody there to help me figure out what I was gonna do when I got home. Like literally, I lived in NA meetings for about a year. When I wasn't visiting my children, when I wasn't being in a cup or doing CPS, um, when I got back to Spokane, I never had a bad UA again, ever. 
Um, this October, I will have 22 years clean. And it is all one day at a time. Um, I have a family, big, big family, that we support each other through life. He said to me on the telephone, because he was in San Diego, and when I did speak to my oldest son, he said, Mom, I want you to get those kids back, get my brothers back. And I said, I'm trying my best. It did. It took me 10 months from losing my children to getting them back. It took me 10 months to get them back. And I never used again. I don't know how. I, I walked into, I opened the right doors. There was the right people that had their hand extended. So now I get to have my hand extended and helping people. I get people into, into treatment in a half hour. You want to go? Let's go. You know? Because you get little windows of time. Us addicts and alcoholics, we, um, I want to speak for myself. I knew what I was doing wasn't the best. I didn't know how to walk away from it. Um, so pulling my children from me, taking them from me, was the worst day of my life. But it was also the best day of my life because they got a mom um, to advocate for them, to love them, teach them. Uh, I haven't thrown anything at anybody in almost 22 years, and I'm really proud of that, <laughs> considering I used to throw stuff. Um, one time I had an iron in my hand. My ex-husband called me crazy like my mother. My mother suffered from schizophrenia. I threw the iron at him. And I told him, well, now we're very good friends. We, him and I are such good friends. I told him what I should have done was kept the cord, brought it back. And, it. <laughs> and he goes, you're so crazy. But my ex-husband not once, not once cussed at me, not once laid a hand on me, not a violent person at all. Are we understanding that? No. It takes a good while. I mean... I felt safe instantly in NA, instantly. There were men with tattoos, but they were vulnerable. And they were talking about the mistakes they've made. They were talking about wanting to change. That, that changes everything for me. I see somebody that's vulnerable, a big burly biker dude, saying that he loves his wife and kids. I'm like, those are my people, you know? Um, such gentle hearts, but have been through. Most of my best friends, somebody talked about a prostitute one day, and I said, excuse me, some of my friends were prostitutes. You know what I mean? Talk about a prostitute like that. Um, that's just the way I feel. You know, we all come from so many backgrounds and abuse and lack of parents. With me, I didn't have parents. It definitely affected me. Uh, I do a lot of things to protect my recovery. One New Year's Eve, uh, 12 midnight, everybody salute, takes the, you know, puts their glass up, and my niece drinks water all the time. And I took what I thought was water. I took a drink, and it was vodka. And I, everybody in that room just stopped and said, <gasps> Auntie took a drink because they had not seen me drink in so many years. And I could feel the alcohol go all the, I could feel exactly where it was going down. It was like on fire. And I literally got my cheeks flushed that day just from one accidental drink. So now when I go to a bar, because somebody's birthday, uh, my sisters go to bars and have birthday parties. So I go. I put three straws in my Coke, so I know it's not, got no alcohol. I have coffee. Everybody in my family, if my auntie's coming, they put a pot of coffee on. They've been very respectful since the day I got clean, not offering me anything to drink. Um, and I've saved a ton of money.